Hello, and welcome to our webcast. I'm Amy Pendergrass with Moss Adams, and I'm going to get us started for today's session, File Your Private Foundations Form 990 PF with Confidence. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief video. Welcome, and thanks for joining us. We're pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts to help companies and individuals conquer challenges as they plan for what's next. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize how you both view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. You can download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget to the right of the slide view. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by typing a question in the Q&A window below the slide view and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of the polling questions, which we'll ask throughout today's presentation. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE Progress widget to open a PDF file that you can save to your computer. Don't worry if you can't download your PDF certificate today. We'll email a copy to you in two weeks. If you're attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our attendance sheet to receive CPE credit. The attendance sheet is available in the slide deck and handouts widget. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. Also note that CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and isn't available to participants who view the on-demand version. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see isn't legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. And now I would like to introduce today's presenters. We have Wendy Campos, partner and tax leader for foundations at Moss Adams, Maggie Elliott, tax manager, Angela Yonda, Senior Consultant, and Jennifer Teixeira, also a Senior Consultant here at Moss Adams. All of the presenter bios and contact information can be found in your webcast console. And now I would like to turn it over to Wendy to get things started. Thank you, Amy. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webcast. We will be reviewing the Form 990 in more detail. I also want to mention that today's webcast is part of a series of webcasts and articles that we'll, we will be hosting and publishing throughout the year to help private foundations navigate the different issues they may face this year, have faced in the past, or in the future, including excise tax issues, charitable planning, and estate planning issues. So please be on the lookout for more information, which we hope to publish soon. I also want to mention before we get started that we have uploaded the 990PF instructions into the platform. Those may be helpful to you as you follow along with the presentation. We also have gone ahead and highlighted certain areas that we're going to touch on today. It's definitely not all inclusive, but it's areas where we're seeing either the most complexities or issues or errors when we look at a 990PF. Also, just want to preface the presentation with this might be too basic for some of you. It might be just right for others, um, but I hope that everyone learns something along the way. Uh, we really just, to start out the series, wanted to just get some basics, basic concepts introduced. Again, really just focus on the form for today's presentation. But like I mentioned, as part of our series, we will be going into a number of topics in the much more depth more technical issues and more complex areas. With that, I would like to turn it over to Maggie Elliott, who will get us started with the 980PS. Thank you, Wendy. Hello, everyone, and welcome. 
the way we're going to approach this presentation today is chronologically. Um, we'll start with the first page and we'll work our way through the 990 PS. Um, to start, I should mention that every 501c3 organization that's classified as a private foundation is required to file this form annually. There are penalties for failing to file timely, completely, or correctly. All parts and lines require entry, including all questions should be answered yes or no, or NA if not applicable. Amounts should be entered on all applicable lines, and zero or none should be input where appropriate. Box J is where the organization's accounting method should be indicated. We often see this blank. Um, cash method is an acceptable method. And it's actually, it is very common, particularly for small and private foundations. If tracking using cash method, please keep in mind that there should be no receivables, prepaid, accrued, or payables. If there is a required audit or a desire for audited financial statement, accrual method may make more sense. This way, book and text methods are the same. Software programs tend to default to cash basis, so if that's not your intent, uh, be aware there. In general, and Angela and Jennifer from our outsourced financial and accounting group will speak at the end today, and I'm sure they'll highlight the importance of this basic step of setting up your books, but we find that's fairly critical. We see a lot of variability among the private foundations we work with. However, those that are knowledgeable and understand how important it is and ultimately align themselves with the right resources operate with much more efficiency as they don't have to dedicate as much time or resources to turning the data into information that ultimately ends up on a given line of the tax return. Okay, on to part one, analysis of review revenue and expenses. Column A, revenue and expenses for books, um, that's book income, which should conform to the financial statements, whether they're your internal financial statements or audited external statements. Column B is net investment income. Expenses are for related to investments are allocated here. Um, and here, please make sure that investment income that is reported on the revenue side, um, if it's unrelated business income, which is often uh, a result from alternative investments, should not be included. Column D, disbursement for charitable purposes, is on cash basis only. Those are charitable allocations um, and things such as legal fees, for example, incurred for grant research or other non-investment related foundation expenses um, should be included here, um, and those must not be included on, in column B. However, column B and column D don't need to foot across, and in many cases they don't. And allocation of shared expenses or overhead expenses, as long as they're reasonable, um, are okay between those two columns. Column C, adjusted net income. It should be left blank unless a private operating foundation. Operating foundations are less common. However, if there are any of you out there that would like some specific content, uh, definitely reach out and please let us know. Finally, um, any in-kind or pro bono goods or services received by a foundation should not be recorded as revenue or expenses in part one. These amounts may be recorded on foundation's financial statements, but they're not, in, not to be included on this form. Part one, line two. This is another area that's commonly missed, but should be completed either by attaching Schedule B or checking the box to certify the organization is not required to complete Schedule B. Part one, line 15, pension plans and employee benefits, payroll taxes, which can be allocated to column B and column D, should be reported here and not on line 18. Excise or property taxes are reported on line 18, and those are typically only in column A. Almost skipped part one, line 16. Those are legal fees, accounting fees, 
and other professional fees. Typically, um, those expenses would be something you would in report to those individuals or organizations on Form 1099 NEC, and those could be allocated between investment, charitable, and also keep in mind unrelated business income if that's applicable. Okay, part two, page two, the balance sheet. This is a fairly simple part. However, we wanted to highlight a few lines here. Line 10, A through C is where investments are listed. And per instructions, the detail of investments does need to be um, included as of the end of the year. So listing individual stocks, bonds, and government obligations, land, building, and other assets in details is required. We often see, you know, stocks grouped or uh, by investment account, and that's not technically accurate. For part three, lines three and five, um, that's where unrealized gains and losses should be disclosed for accrual method or modified cash basis organizations. If you are on cash method, you may not have any um, unrealized gains here. And Amy, it looks like we have a polling question. All right, thank you. So our first polling question is uh, to get a feel for our audience for today. It's what type or size private foundation or other organization are you? A, private foundation, no alternative. B, private foundation, alternative investment. C, professional advisor, or D, other. And we will give you a few moments to respond. Uh, to participate, please click the button next to the answer you choose and hit submit. Also, uh, while everyone's responding, I do want to use this time to remind you, uh, if you have any questions, during the webcast for the presenters, you can use the Q&A window in your console. It looks like almost everyone has responded. Okay, here are the results. Looks like a lot of other primarily, uh, second with private foundation with alternative investments. Um, so good, good to get a feel for the audience. I did before we move on, Maggie moves on to the next page, I did want to make just a couple comments about the balance sheet section. Um, you'll notice in the instructions on the first page, the instructions always start with what's new for the year and then some reminders. Um, one area of the balance sheet that has changed is it's reporting consistent with those that have audited financial statements. So the net assets has been updated to reference with or without donor restrictions. So there is a question on that part of the balance sheet, whether you are uh, following ASC 958, which is just, again, a FASB gap financial statement concept regarding that with or without donor restrictions. So keep that in mind. And then the only other area I wanted to mention on the balance sheet is just line, uh, it, it's the other investments. That's where we typically would see alternative investments being disclosed, but specific, the instructions indicate you would not put program related investments on that line. They do have a specific line where they like to see program related investments. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Maggie. Okay. Well, we will move on to part four, um, which is page three, capital gains and losses for tax, in, tax investment income. Unlike the balance sheet, detail of publicly traded securities here is not required. In fact, if it's just publicly traded securities, um, gains and losses you're reporting here, line Column A um, description should be publicly traded securities and column B through D should be left blank. Tax basis is used for sales. 
except for contributed stock, in which case you would use the donor's basis. Part five um, is no longer applicable. Section 4940E has been repealed and starting with the tax years beginning December 20th, 2019, there's now just a flat tax rate of 1.39%. Page four, here we would like to highlight the importance of trigger questions and the impact of responses or partaking in these activities. Part 7A, line three, Changes not previously reported to the IRS. You should check yes if the organization updated documents. And for example, if you have updated a new copy of bylaws, a copy of those should be attached with the annual return. Page five, part seven, B, line one A, four. Compensation or reimbursement of expenses of a disqualified person. We often see this checked no, which could be incorrect. For example, if salary is paid or travel expenses are reimbursed to a chief executive officer who is a disqualified person, that should be checked yes, and reasonable compensation is an exception to self-dealing, so further down um, line 1B would be checked no. And we have some self-dealing examples here. So for example, a disqualified person can rent office space to a private foundation um, for without any cost. Um, however, you cannot rent even if it's best beneficial to the foundation at a below fair market value um, price. You could donate property to a private foundation, but donating, private, uh, donating property with any mortgage or any loans um, is considered self-dealing. Um, one of the common ones we see is if a private foundation receives tickets, um, a disqualified person can't if they can't make it to the event, um, giving those tickets to someone else to attend is not appropriate if they're not board members. And here's a few more examples. So private foundation makes a grant to a public charity at the direction of the disqualified person on the board and that um, public charity is in line and the grant is in line with the private foundation's exempt purpose, that's appropriate. However, if a grant was to be made to a public charity to fulfill a pledge that was previously made by a disqualified person, that's considered self-dealing. If a private foundation gives a gift to a disqualified person and it's just a token gift, um, value is less than $25, for example, flowers or a card, um, that's appropriate. However, if it's a gift of cash that was not included as taxable income, let's say it's a $500 gift card, that would not be appropriate. And here's just a few self-dealing exceptions. So if the transaction causes the person to become a substantial contributor, um, for example, a discount purchase, self-dealing rules do not apply. Um, if a board member leaves the board and then enters into a transaction with the private foundation, that's also not self-dealing. As mentioned before, a board member can be paid for their services on the board and the expenses can be reimbursed so long as they are all reasonable. And um, you could also pay compensation for professional ser services, um, such as accounting, legal. Um, it does not include things like general, uh, janitorial work, for example. And with that, I think we have another polling question, Amy. All right, so our second polling question is, uh, if you pay your CEO, executive director, reasonable compensation for services provided to the foundation, should part 7A line 
1A4 be answered yes? And uh, the answers are A, yes, B, no, C, yes, but an exception applies. And as a reminder, if you would like to receive CPE credit for today's webcast, you will need to respond to at least three of the polling questions. And we will leave this up for another 10 seconds or so to make sure everyone gets their CPE credit. Okay, here are the results. Well, good, just about everybody got that one, 51%. Yes, but an exception applies, and that, that is correct. Yes is also correct. We just made it a little bit tricky with the yes, but an exception applies. And Maggie, I think you were going to have a couple more slides, one, maybe one more slide before I will take it over. Okay, getting back to part 7B, statements regarding activities for which form 40, 70, 4720 may be required. Um, so there's some lobbying questions um, um, regarding propaganda, and grants, um, if you do give a, we wanted to highlight 5A, um, specifically lines four and five here. Um, and so to make sure that any expenditure responsibility is done if the grants are given to non-public um, charities. Part eight is the board listing. All officers who serve during the year should be listed here with their titles, any compensation. And typically for the addresses, um, we do recommend that the foundation's address is used and then not personal addresses just to protect those individuals' privacy. Lastly, part eight, line two, is compensation of the highest paid employees. So anyone who's paid over fifty thousand um, dollars should be listed here. And part eight, line three, is five highest paid compensated independent contractors. And so names and addresses of those, as well as types of services, should be listed here and their compensation which typically corresponds to the amount that's been reported on their 1099s for the calendar year. And with that, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Wendy. Great, thank you, Maggie. Before we go over part 10 and continue on with the form, I did wanna add a couple of comments um, one, referencing back to the 980PF instructions, on page four of the instructions, they do have a definition section, and that does give you some definitions of who is a disqualified person and who is a foundation manager, and that helps with some of that self-dealing area. And like I mentioned at the beginning, this is not intended to go through all of these concepts in depth. We will have future webcasts and articles that are going to for example, be focused just on self-dealing, be focused just on taxable expenditures, just on um, you know, other types of excise taxes and areas that are higher risk or where we see a lot of issues or questions. So just keep that in mind. This is really meant to be introductory. Uh, another comment I wanted to make, and I, I see this as a question in the chat as well, it is good best practice to one, Make sure you're getting conflict of interest policies signed at least annually by your board members and your officers at least. And for a private foundation, those really should be a bit more robust than maybe a public charity or other types of entities may use. 
you do need to understand what kind of investments, for example, your disqualified persons have to compare those to the foundations. You do need to understand what other boards your disqualified persons might be sitting on. Um, so you should be maintaining a list of your disqualified persons and you should have a good list internally of those conflicts of interest and different, like I said, investments, board positions, so that you can reference those. You know, your program staff may not know that a certain organization that the foundation wants to give to might have a number of officers or a number of board members of the private foundation on it. it doesn't mean you can't give to it, but you might need to take additional steps to make sure it's a very independent decision. Um, so just keep that in mind as well. I just wanted to mention those couple of things. All right, so back to the form, part 10. This is the minimum investment return section, and this is where it starts the calculation to determine your minimum distribution requirement annually. This section calculates the fair market value of assets that are not used or held for charitable activities or charitable purposes. So you would not include any program related investments in this section. You would not be required to include any office equipment, for example, that your program staff are using. Um, any, if you have a building and a lot of it is taken up by program staff, there might be an allocation and you wouldn't need to include the fair market value of the entire building in this calculation, just to give you some examples. Assets that ten, tend to always be required to be included in this section, um, line 1A, the average monthly fair market value of securities. This would, could be your publicly traded securities, your managed accounts. The requirement here to calculate the average is any reasonable method. So it could be you use beginning a month, end of month, average for the 12 months. It could be you, you just use end of month, average for the 12 months. The key is that you decide on a method that it's reasonable and you stay consistent with that method. method. You're not flip-flopping year after year. Line 1B is a little more restrictive. This is average of monthly cash balances. The instructions do indicate that monthly cash should be calculated using the beginning of month and end of month cash balances averaged over the 12 months. So that is very specific and not flexibility there in terms of how you calculate that. Line 1C, the fair market value of all other assets. Other assets could be real estate, it could be alternative investments, um, it would be anything else on your balance sheet that isn't, again, used in the charitable purpose and is not program-related investments. The method for calculating here is typically you just use your end-of-year fair market value. You don't have to average. We do have some private foundations that average, and that's a method that they've decided on. Again, the key is just stay consistent with that method and don't flip-flop it and change it on a regular basis. Um, for real estate, in terms of fair market value, if you get an appraisal, an independent appraisal, you can rely on that fair market value from that appraisal for five years. For alternatives, you know, if you have audited financial statements, they're going to be utilizing fair market value for those audited financial statements. So you've got that value each year. You may not have it, you know, by May 15th. You Most of the time, our private foundations that are heavy into alternatives have to extend just to give time for the audit to be complete, the investment information to come in, and then on the back end for the tax return, the K-1s as well. But those, those audited statements for each of those funds, each of those alternatives will have a fair market value amount. If you are not having an audit and you do have some alternative investments, I believe that you could go to the fund and they should be able to provide you with an end of year fair market value because that fund is most likely being audited. That's what we see in most cases. So you should have some way to obtain that fair market value for alternative assets. If for real estate you decide not to do an appraisal, there could be an opportunity for someone that's well-versed, that knows real estate, to provide a value 
But if you went that method, you'd have to do that every year. You couldn't necessarily just utilize that value for five years. So keep that in mind. Line two, I wanted to point this out. We don't see this quite as often. This is acquisition indebtedness applicable to line one assets. Most commonly, we would see this with real estate. If there is debt on the real estate, you would put that debt here on this line and that would reduce the fair market value that's used to calculate your minimum investment return. Now, the reason we don't see it as often is that it could create unrelated business income issues to have debt on an investment, a real estate investment asset. It could create self-dealing issues depending on if that debt was on it when it came into the foundation. Um, but not to say that it's not out there. You know, we definitely have some private foundations where that exists, but I wanted to point that out. All right, parts 11 and 12. This continues along the path to calculate that minimum distribution requirement. Part 11, distributable amount. This is calculating what, based on all the different numbers on the return and the pages we've gone through to this point, what do you have available that could be distributed? A couple things I wanted to point out here. Line four, recoveries of amount treated as qualifying distributions. This could be refunds of prior year grants. This could be a principal payment on a program-related investment that's come back in. It could be a sale of a fixed asset that was used in the charitable purpose. These are all items that would have to be indicated here, and they're going to add to that minimum distribution requirement for the year. Part 12, qualifying distributions. This determines, again, based on all the numbers so far on the return, all your fact pattern, what you have that qualifies to go towards that minimum distribution requirement. So obviously, your grants and contributions, any allocable administrative expenses that are allocable to charitable. Line two, amounts paid to acquire assets used or held for use in, in carrying out the charitable purpose. This could be fixed assets that you purchase during the year for the program staff, for example. It could be a building where part of it's allocable for program purposes. Maybe all of it's allocable for program purposes. Maybe all your investment activity is off-site or outsourced. And then there is also line 1B, which I skipped over, but I want to mention program-related investments. So if you entered into a new program-related investment for the year, you would also enter that amount here. All right, part 13, and I'll be honest, we debated including this page or not. It's definitely an important part of the tax return. It's just a very complex calculation. And there are some concepts on here that we're not going to cover today because they are more involved and they, they might be part of a future piece that we'll have available as part of our series. And then the other thing I want to mention about this page in particular before we move on, and this would apply to all the pages of the return, but um, if you have traditionally used, prepared your own return, for example, and you've used fillable forms, they're not going to automatically have formulas built into them. What I have found is this page in particular can be challenging for folks to fill out because of that fact, because it doesn't automatically, you know, in our software and most tax preparation softwares, they're carrying almost all of these numbers are coming from different parts of the form that we've already gone through. But in the case of if you use a fillable form, which we'll talk about e-filing here at the end, but if you were using a fillable form, you have to know where to pull the numbers from in the form. So that's kind of why I mentioned it's, it's somewhat complex. But this is basically coming down to what's your undistributed income for the end of the year, or what's your excess distribution carry forward. And it takes into account if you had undistributed income from 2019, starting with the amount you have available to go towards your minimum distribution requirement, 
how much should be applied first to that 2019 amount, and then what do you have left to apply for 2020's minimum distribution requirement? And then after that, do you have an excess or do you still have undistributed income that needs to be paid out by 1231, 2021 in this case? And we should mention that you do have a year to pay this out. So if you're a calendar year taxpayer, which the bulk of private foundations we see are, not all, but most are, if you, with this 1231-2020 return, for example, if you have an undistributed income amount, you have until 1231-2021 to pay that out without being subject to any excise taxes for under distributing. And again, that's assuming you've already met all the 2019 undistributed income amounts through your 2020 um, qualifying distributions. So I mentioned program-related investments a couple of times when we went through that minimum distribution requirement section and the minimum investment return. But I wanted to just mention a few other things about program-related investments, PRIs. I did mention already they are excluded from the foundation's assets on which the 5% minimum investment return is calculated. A payment of a PRI counts towards the minimum distribution requirement. And a repayment in a future year may increase that minimum distribution requirement. I just wanted to be able to give you a quick summary of how PRIs can impact that minimum distribution requirement. I know a lot of foundations have been doing PRIs for a while, but we still find that it's an area some private foundations aren't very familiar with. Um, so I just kind of wanted to give you a slide that gives you a quick recap of how it impacts that minimum distribution requirement. All right, Amy, it's time for another polling question. All right, so our third polling question. Uh, is interest income from a PRI subject to the net investment income tax of 1.39%? And this one's easy with a yes or no uh, option. And for those that would like a copy of today's slides, you can download them from the folder that says slide deck and handouts in your console. And we will also be sending them out via email tomorrow along with a copy of a recording of the webcast. I think I'll try to tackle a couple Q&A while we're waiting for the results. Uh, Ruth Collins asked, does other assets include accounts receivable or prepaid rent or taxes? That's a very good question. I'm glad you asked that. I should have covered more descriptions of what other assets would be. Yes and no, it really depends. If the accounts receivable is related to investment income, maybe it's dividends receivable, interest receivable, then yes. Same with prepaid rent. If the rent is somehow for an investment asset and not charitable or it's out partial, partially allocable, then you would include that portion that's related to the investment asset. Taxes, if that's your excise taxes, then no, I would not include that, um, but very good question. All right, here are the results. For oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, I was just saying the results are ready. Great. 62.6% um, said yes, and I apologize, we didn't actually cover this, so those that, that got yes, that is the correct answer, um, and you did very well. Those that got no, no worries. We didn't even, we didn't touch on it. We didn't explain to you that interest income is investment income, but this was kind of a way to point that out. So your principal, we talked a lot about the principal and repayments, but we didn't mention the interest. So you would have to include that, in, that interest income as net investment income. I was just going to answer one more question before we move on. Are excess distributions only tracked for the year shown, or do they carry for longer periods? Very good question. The excess distributions carry forward for five years, so that is why that schedule is limited to five years. All right, we're on our last two, well, last section of the form, two different, breaking it up into two buckets. 
part 15. This is supplemental information. And you will notice, I'm gonna go ahead and get the rest of it on the, there we go. You will notice that they have um, condensed the second part of this section, which I'll talk about in just a second. But the first part, we just wanted to highlight part 15, line one, information regarding foundation managers, because we do see this get left blank in situations where there probably should have been foundation managers listed. List any managers of the foundation who have contributed more than 2% of the total contributions received by the foundation before the close of any tax year, only if they have contributed more than $5,000. So if your founder is a board member and they've been the primary contributor, we would expect to see them listed here. Um, you know, it, it's, it would be surprising if there wasn't somebody and somebody person could be a business. It could be an estate. It's not necessarily just an individual. So keep that in mind. And then for the grants and contributions paid during the year or approved for future payment, this has been condensed. We usually see half a page for paid during the year, half a page for future. Um, obviously there will be supplemental schedules that will go with this that software programs will allow. So it's not that you have to limit your input to this. This is just, they've just shortened it up on the actual core part of the form. A couple things I wanted to mention here for individuals, if you're giving scholarships, one, you do need to make sure that you've got pre-approval from the IRS. Most private foundations did this as part of their application for tax exemption, but you do wanna make sure of that if you haven't given scholarships before, but you would like to. That is something specific that has to be pre-approved. If the private foundation is making the determination of those individuals that are going to receive a scholarship from the private foundation, then really the individual needs to be listed and the individual's address, not the university that they're going to attend. The second column, if that recipient is an individual, you would have to indicate any relationship to a foundation manager. So if it's a board member's daughter or, you know, grandchild, something like that, you would have to list that. And obviously you would want to go through an independent process to make that determination before it's ever making it onto a tax return. But keep that in mind. My point here is just to point out that it is transparent. When you're giving to organizations, the foundation status of recipient, the third column comes into play. It does for an individual as well, but I want to highlight a couple things for organizations. Um, the most common we would see is PC, which is public charity. That's your 501c3 public charities, you know, Red Cross, United Way, a church. If you give to a state school or a government entity, there, there are codes for each of these types. So this column should have a code, GOV for a government. The instructions do have the list of codes in them, um, and so that's always a good reference for you, and that is on page 35 of the instructions. The other code I wanted to point out is NC. So this is an organization not otherwise classified, so non-charitable. This could be a foreign organization. It could be a 501c6. It could be a 501c4, and we're going to talk about consequences of giving to those types of organizations here on the next slides. All right, so we have a slide on expenditure responsibility. I just want to give a quick summary of what that is and what that means. So if you have given to certain organizations that are not 501c3 public charities, that might be okay, but you've got to exercise expenditure responsibility for that to be okay. And when it's required, a private foundation must exert all reasonable effort, efforts and establish adequate procedures. So they need to make sure that the expenditure is spent solely for the purposes for which it was made. So this is gonna include pre-grant inquiries, grant agreements, obtaining full and complete reports from the recipient on how those funds are spent, and make full and complete reports on the expenditures to the IRS on the foundation's Form 990PF. So, if you had in that grant section a grant to a non-charitable with that code NC, you probably also had to answer some of those questions Maggie went over as yes, 
And there's also a question about whether you exercise expenditure responsibility. And, and the IRS will look to see that you have those appropriate statements attached to the return. So it's a much more onerous due diligence process if you're going to give to certain non-public charity organizations. This is really for your reference. I'm not gonna go through this in detail because like I mentioned, we are going to go through some of these topics in future webcasts and article series throughout the year. This is just a chart of ex different excise taxes that a private foundation could be subject to and the initial tax and additional tax. What I do wanna point out is some of these taxes, in particular self-dealing, those are not taxes that the private foundation is subject to. Those are taxes that the self-dealer or the foundation manager in some cases are subject to, and they must be paid by those individuals or businesses and not the private foundation, or you've just created another self-dealing transaction. For expenditure responsibility, this just gives you a little insight if you don't exercise this, that there is secondary tax involved there as well. And this just gives you, much like we did with self-dealing, just what type of grant recipients does expenditure responsibility apply to? On the left, does not apply to U.S. public charities, executive order organizations. On the right, you can see that list is much longer. So your 501c6s, C4s, private foundations, certain supporting organizations, newly formed public charities who have not received their IRS determination letter, for-profit entities. So keep in mind that expenditure responsibility can come into play with your program-related investments, because we often see program-related investments where you're partnering with a for-profit entity. And in foreign organizations for which no equivalency affidavit or determination letter has been obtained. All right, electronic filing requirements. Some of you are likely already electronically filing, but we did want to mention this because this is very important information for those that have not in the past. The Form 990PF now must be e-filed starting with tax years that started in 2020. So if you're a calendar year, you are required to e-file. Also keep in mind, this has been in place for a long time, but we still get this question. The excise tax must be paid through EFTPS, the Electronic Filing Tax Payment System. The Form 990-T is expected to be available for e-file for 2020. And then the 1023 application for exemption is now required to be completed and submitted through pay.gov. So you can see the theme as the IRS is finally catching up and going to a more electronic method versus paper filing. All right, Amy, we have another polling question. All right, so our next polling question is, effective for years beginning on or after July 2nd, 2019, all private foundations, regardless of size, must electronically file their annual Form 990-PS annually. Uh, A, true, B, false. And once you have completed all CPE requirements, you will be able to download a PDF of your certificate from the CPE progress window. And we'll give everyone a few more seconds to get their answer in to make sure you get your CPE for today's webcast. All right, here are the results. 85% indicated true, and that, that is correct. All right, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer. Jennifer and Angela are in our outsourced financial accounting group, and we worked closely with them on a number of clients, and we just thought it would be helpful for them to be able to share some insight into, you know, there's a lot of information that we just went over that you have to report on the 980PF. Often there's ways that you can use your accounting system. If you're looking into a new accounting system, ways you can set up your chart of accounts. 
And if you're using outsourced accountants, ways that you can work together collaboratively to get better reporting out of your system. So some of these sections of the form can be prepared in a more streamlined way. So with that, I will turn it over to Jennifer. Wendy, hi everyone. So as Wendy just mentioned, um, I'm part of our outsourced finance and accounting group and we work very closely uh, with our tax teams during the planning and preparation time to get them the information they need um, for our mutual clients. And so I'm just going to touch on a couple things that we've seen and best practices uh, based on our experiences we've had with handling accounting for our private foundation clients. Um, from an accounting perspective, so related to the tax return information gathering and planning process, one important thing to keep in mind when you're starting out, or maybe if you're not starting out but looking to do a revamp of your accounting structure, um, is the development of your accounting and the reporting structure and how that can accommodate or mesh, if you will, uh, with the information needed for tax planning and tax return preparation. So really just you know, dedicating that time up front and being thoughtful um, around the various accounts you'll use, maybe any department or class tracking, uh, will definitely help make things easier down the road. And so that being said, you know, while it is very important and a priority for that chart of accounts to be effective for internal management purposes, um, several of those accounts might already serve a dual purpose, right, and help with the tax information gathering. There might be others you may want to consider um, or at least have a reasonable understanding of so that when it comes time to pull that information uh, for the tax process, it's easy to do so. So just overall really making the efforts to streamline your accounting and reporting structure uh, will assist in making the year-end tax planning process and preparation of the returns much easier, um, more effective and efficient for both your tax professional. And so just taking that last slide one step further, um, here are some considerations from a chart of accounts perspective, um, or what is also referred to as the natural classifications that you may want to consider. Um, as I'm sure you saw in the earlier slides that Maggie and Wendy went over, the accounts listed here tie nicely to the information uh, that your tax preparer will need for the tax return. But again, like mentioned before, you know, these are also likely to be things you have already considered tracking on your books for internal management purposes, which is great. So you know, any contributions, gifts, or grants received and paid, um, if you have an investment account, any related income and expenses to that, uh, compensation of officers, directors, and trustees, um, anything related to employee salaries, and so I, you saw earlier in, in the webcast um, on the forum, it asked for the five highest paid, and so while that might not be built into your chart of accounts per se, just being cognizant of having that information available, whether it be in your general ledger or maybe you're using a third-party payroll provider where you can run a report from um, to, to provide that information. Uh, contractors, again, five highest paid there, rent, um, professional fees, the form does separate out legal and accounting um, from other professional fees, so that's something to consider. Any travel, conferences and meetings, printing and publications, and then of course depreciation and taxes. Another area to consider um, in terms of your accounting and reporting structure is any additional tracking that you might need on top of that sort of chart of accounts or natural classifications that we just discussed in the prior slide. So if you're using something like QuickBooks maybe, that system refers to these additional fields um, as classes or even a department field. Similarly, if you're in a more robust system, maybe like an intact or a net suite, those fields are typically referred to as dimensions or custom fields. And so the three listed here um, are pretty common on the private foundation side. We have administration, investment, um, and programs. And again, you know, this type of information is reported, required to be reported on the return. So really just having it already built into your accounting system um, and tracking it up front is extremely helpful so then you don't have to go back you know, and do it annually at year end when tax time comes. Thank you, Jen. My name is Angela Yanda, and along with Jen, I work in the Outsourced Finance and Accounting Group at Moss Adams. And as Jen mentioned, investment upfront in formatting your chart of accounts and thoughtfully using those account dimensions is going to pay dividends later on when it comes time to complete your 990. And before we uh, close out the presentation today, I want to make the case for where you can also structuring professional services contracts themselves for accounting and tax support thoughtfully and intentionally from the outset. I want to step back for just a minute 
and highlights something called the vested business model or methodology. So many of you on the call today probably do your tax preparation and accounting entirely in-house. Others of you may outsource parts of this, or you may be a service provider attending this presentation. Uh, whatever your circumstances, consider this model. This idea of vested is something that was developed by Kate Vitasic and others at the University of Tennessee, and based on their research beginning in about 2003. So whereas a traditional outsourcing or tax-related service contract might be transaction-based, a vested partnership is intentionally relationship-based. It's outcome-based, and it's based on shared, well-articulated values, or uh, what's in it for we mindset. So we find this model is an especially good fit when we partner with not-for-profit clients because there is so often such a strong parallel between the principles of this vested business relationship model and the fundamental grounding principles that guide your work as a private foundation. Those are principles such as equity and integrity, loyalty, transparency, and reciprocity with autonomy. So when a professional services contract is built as a vested partnership with agreed upon outcomes, co-created values, shared vision and principles in place from the beginning, we find that trust and transparency increase, innovation is incentivized, communication lines stay open, and it is just a gosh darn fun way to work together. So without spending any more time pulling that apart, I will close by saying the next time you are contracting for services, whether it be tax preparation, consulting, or something else, know that this methodology is out there and is an option. And I'm super happy to connect individually and share articles if it's something that you want to explore further. Uh, but for now, I believe we have one more polling question, so I will pass it back to Amy. All right, thank you. So we did throw in a, a bonus polling question here. And so that is, what private foundation topics or areas do you believe you need more information on or advice on for the future? Uh, a, self-dealing, B, taxable expenditures, C, excess business holdings, D, unrelated business income, E, alternative investments, or F, other. And if you do uh, submit the other option, you can feel free to put a comment in the Q&A window to send us um, what other information you would like uh, or topics. And also we encourage you to complete the survey as well. That would be another good area to provide us with feedback on future topics, areas you'd like us to go more in, more in depth. And we realized this was a lot of information in a 50 minute window and going through forms can be challenging. Um, we've done these 990 PF presentations a number of different ways. And we just thought that this might be a good way to kick off the series, knowing that there are areas everyone's gonna want more information on. So we, we would love your feedback. All right, it looks like Unrelated business income, 26.2%, followed by taxable expenditures at 23.1%, um, and then other alternatives and self-dealing pretty close. I guess alternatives, 18.5%. That's really helpful information. I, I just want to say one thing. I've done a lot of presentations on unrelated business income over the years as well, and I think it never gets old. We get the most questions from that topic the most follow-up and the most requests for more information on unrelated business income. So that, that actually does not surprise me and we will definitely make sure that that's part of, of our series this year. And we hope that you stay tuned and look for more content. All right, so I am going to go ahead and get us closed out since we have uh, one minute to go. Um, here are some links to some Moss Adams insights and resources, and they are also in your console if you would like to go ahead and click on those links there as well. And thank you, Wendy, Maggie, Angela, and Jennifer for a great presentation today. And if we didn't have time to answer your questions, we will do our best to follow up with you after the webcast.
And as a reminder, if you attended today's presentation in a group and would like to receive CPE credit, you must complete the group attendance sheet found in your console. And if you participated as an individual and met all requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window. I will keep the console open for a few minutes to give you time to download. A copy will be emailed within three weeks should you have any difficulty downloading it now. And here is a link to an online survey, uh, the survey that Wendy mentioned earlier, where you can provide feedback on today's presentation. And please take a minute to complete the survey as your feedback is very important to us. And thank you for joining our webcast. We hope you'll join us again next time.